as Lord. Why don't you stand with me and let's see if we can do this short song together.
praise this morning for his greatness. A uh, word, an attribute that comes to mind, just speak it out. Spiritual songs. We've got lots of little choruses and songs that we sing. Uh, let's try a simple love song that we sing to him. I love you, Lord. Notice the words. You're singing it to him. Not to anyone nearby, not to me. Uh, it's between you and him this morning. If you know it by heart, close your eyes. If not, uh, focus on what you're saying so that it's, uh, it's sentimental, it's meaningful. It's just not a song that we're singing in rote. Let's sing it to him. I love you, Lord. And I live. That's hard to do, isn't it? We've got to really work at focusing on Him. Getting our eyes, our spiritual eyes focused on Him. Just letting everything else kind of slide behind it. It'll be there when you're done. But you'll be renewed in your spirit and able, better able to serve Him with your life. Let's try that again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
to refocus ourselves, our lives, our affections on you, that everything else would just kind of fade into the background in comparison to you, your goodness, your glory, your mercy, your love, your faithfulness. Teach us how to refocus day in and day out. Show us how to better love, honor, and serve you, not just with our lips, but with our lives. And that in a way that would not only honor you, but it would draw the attention of others to you. That they would recognize your reality by your reality in us. We need your help to do that, but we ask for that this morning and we thank you. We give you praise. Always and only through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Hey, why don't you take just a moment, if you would, uh, turn around and look for an unfamiliar face. There's got to be at least one here this morning. Introduce yourself to them. Why don't you grab a seat, if you would, grab a seat. (laughs) 
We have been uh, working our way through the 23rd Psalm with our kids. And I'd like to pick up where we left off last week. Just for a sec, if you're a kid on your feet this morning, let's get a look at you. I see you out there somewhere. There's several over here. We've got a few up here, back there. Uh, we are talking about God as if he were a shepherd and we were his what? Sheep. What do you know about sheep? Anybody have sheep in 4-H here? How do we do in 4-H? Anybody showing sheep this, this year? No sheep showers. Boy, then we can't, could we use pigs? Would you like to uh, reckon yourself as a pig instead of a sheep? Uh, maybe a sheep's a little kinder uh, metaphor, isn't it? Uh, he's the shepherd, we're his sheep. And because we know him as a good shepherd, Jesus tells us, tells us we know he's going to take care of us, don't we? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I'm not going to lack anything. I'm not going to have want in my life. And then he goes on to say the kinds of things that shepherds do for sheep. Remember, where does he make them lie down? Green pastures. Where does he lead them by? What does he restore? Their sanity. Don't you love that? He's the kind of shepherd that can do that. Some of you are losing it. Uh, you need to look to him. He leads me in paths of righteousness. What in the world does that mean? I've never seen a path of righteousness. I've never seen a sign that says path of righteousness this way. You know, and conversely, path of wickedness that way. That's kind of what it means, though, isn't it? David said the shepherd will lead you to take the right path. If you'll follow him, the right path. Uh, some friends and I were climbing a mountain in Tucumán, Argentina. Uh, the foothills of the Andes look like a mountain for comparison to what we see the hills around here. 10, 11,000 feet. I don't know. It wasn't gigantic, but it was big enough for us. We made it to the top. And on the way down, uh, we got separated. Pablo and Ugo went one way at a little ravine, and I went to the left. They took the right path. It was the way we came up. I thought there was a shortcut. And the shortcut became the long sh cut. Has anybody ever taken one of those? The, the, the cheap way ends up being the expensive way. Have you noticed that? And I followed this path, and the path got narrower and narrower and narrower until it took me around a giant cliff, and there was a river running alongside of it and a waterfall. And I just thought, you know, if I can just skirt this cliff around this path uh, to the other side, I'm sure I can get down from here. And so I started going out on this cliff, and as I said, the path got narrower and narrower until all it was was a ledge about that wide. And I was probably more like that wide, but it felt that wide. And I remember edging along, holding on to the rocks behind me, the, the cliff, thinking, I wonder how much farther this path goes. Because I could. it was like this. It went around a corner, and I couldn't see around the corner. And I was just hoping that when I got around the corner, guess what? Home free. There would be a paved road right there that would take me to the bottom. I got stuck out there. I'm lucky to be alive here this morning. My kids are lucky to have been born. That could have been it at age 21, 22. I don't know how old I was. I was stranded on this cliff, and I couldn't turn around. It was so, so small, the ledge that I was on, that I was afraid to turn around. I wanted to go face towards the cliff and work my way back, and I couldn't even do that. I mean, if I sneezed, ha I would have pushed my bottom off of the thing and over the edge I would have gone. That's how tight it was. And my knees started knocking. You know what I'm talking about, anybody? I mean, I was in dire straits. And I hear a call from my friend Pablo across the river there. Just a waterfall. I could hardly hear anything. And I see him calling to me, and they're waving, saying, wrong way. I had figured that out at that point. It's this way. Well, to make a long story short, I made it back. Whether you realize it or not, I, 
got my way back to the regular path. I went back up to where we had split, and I came on the other side of the ravine, and we made it. I took the wrong path, and it could have been a disaster. Paul, or David says that Jesus is a shepherd that will lead us to take right paths, make the right choices, and he does it, he tells us, for whose namesake? He leads me in paths of righteousness for my namesake? That's not what David said. It's for his namesake. What is God's namesake? For the sake of the name, we see that in the New Testament even. For his reputation. It's so that God's reputation will stand true. Boy, that's, he's put a lot to risk on you and I, hasn't he? When I choose, when you choose the wrong path, guess whose reputation suffers? Ultimately, it puts a bad uh, spin on who God is, the wrong spin, because he's not that kind of a God. So God wants you to learn to determine which is the right path and which is the wrong path. And every day, maybe often times during a day, you might have to choose right over wrong. And sometimes you might even have to ask the good shepherd, which path do I take, Lord? I'm not sure what to do about this. What's the right thing to do? Every time he'll show you because he leads in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You understand that? Got some work to do this week. We're, we're starting up school, aren't we? There's uh, going to be some forks in the road here, I'm sure, this year. For some of you, for all of us, even the adults, aren't we? Thank God for the good shepherd who leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let's follow him this week. Let's do that. Hey, you're dismissed. I'm going to send you out that door right there, and we'll catch you afterwards. Uh, as they're going, wanted to uh, just highlight uh, the Tijuana team is, uh, is coming together for this year's trip. Uh, Bill... And Cindy Penn, around here somewhere, I saw you this morning, are, uh, have agreed to lead the team this year. Uh, Going to be over Thanksgiving week. We've got that week booked again. Uh, boy, check in with them afterwards if you're interested. There's a sign-up sheet in the hall. Uh, you may want to sign on just uh, at this point. So we've got a tentative uh, count of how many people are interested in this year's trip. Also, there's a sign-up sheet for the canoe hike, uh, father-son canoe hike, grandfather, grandson canoe hike. If you'd like to go, uh, check the sheet out there. Let me know. We're just getting a head count for number of canoes and the food that we'll need uh, to make the, uh, the trek. So heads up on that. Finally, I wanted to mention, uh, uh, Everett, you have a procedure tomorrow. Heart cath, is that right? Yeah, we want to pray for you. What time is that tomorrow? 9.30 tomorrow morning. Would you do us a favor, do them a favor, and pray forever tomorrow morning at 9.30. Ask the Lord's grace upon him in this procedure. Uh, we'll just continue to commit you into his care. All right, if you have a uh, bulletin, why don't you turn to the inside cover? We have been looking at uh, this uh, theme for the summer. The Christian life is a matter of the mind. To a large degree, what you think impacts how you feel and what you do, who you are as a person. And God has much to say about your intellect. The Christian life is an intentional life. There's a purpose, there's meaning, and God wants you to live it as such, uh, the Christian life. So we've looked at different aspects of the mind, the mind or the role of the mind in salvation, the role of the mind in sanctification, that is in spiritual growth. Uh, we've been talking about some of the spiritual disciplines that you and I intentionally, on purpose, participate in. Uh, worship, we've talked about fellowship, we've talked about uh, stewardship, we've talked about service. This morning I'd like to pick up with the, the discipline of evangelism. That I have to intentionally, on purpose, think about what the gospel means and how to explain it to others around me. Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. Anybody ever act as a witness or acted as a witness, court of law? 
If you have, you put your hand on the Bible when you go up. You know the routine, don't you? Even if you've not done it, you've seen it. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the? So help you, God? I do. Take the stand. Now, the witness's job at that point is not to convince anybody of anything. His job is not to sway the jury or the judge. He's got one assignment, according to his oath there, just to tell what he knows. Don't need opinions. We don't need extrapolations. All we need to know is what happened to you in light of this uh, case, court case that we are examining. What was your experience? Jesus told his disciples, you will be my witnesses. Tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Tell people what you know, what you've experienced. You don't have to convince anybody of anything. It's not your job to convert people. Your job is just to share your own experience. A witness simply tells what he knows. I like the, uh, the occasion in John 9 where Jesus heals a blind man. And he's taken to, in so many uh, words, a court case is made of it. Uh, the religious leaders grill him severely. They pull him aside and they threaten to disassociate him with Judaism, kick him out of the synagogue, he and his family. And the guy finally comes to this conclusion. He says this, he says, whether he is the Messiah or not, I'm not sure. But this much I know. Remember the line, don't you? I was blind, but now I see. And there was no disputing his personal experience. Nobody can dispute your personal experience. Your personal experience weighs more than somebody else's arguments, somebody else's opinions. We can't deny that people have had certain experiences. Now, how do we define those experiences? That's another thing, isn't it? But the fact that you have had an experience in your life, you've experienced God, you've experienced change, is powerful. And the assignment we have is to tell people about our experience, to be witnesses. I like the Apostle Paul's take on this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, where he's reminding Timothy what his life was like before he met Timothy. You wouldn't have recognized me back then. He said, I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. But then he goes on, but I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance. I don't know any blasphemers here. Anybody uh, live a violent life at any point in your past? And like the Apostle Paul, you can say, you know, that's what I used to be like until I met the master, until I encountered Jesus Christ. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Have they reached the uttermost parts of the earth? Boy, we're getting there. Uh, this isn't the uttermost parts of the earth, but you can see it on a clear day from here. And the disciples started a process that for 2,000 years has continued. You and I have picked up on it, and we were part of the movement, witnessing of what God has done through Jesus Christ. Another word that we use is to testify, to, to share your testimony, which don't let that word scare you. It sounds sanctimonious, doesn't it? It just means story. People love to tell stories. They love to hear stories. I told my wife one of my uh, bucket list items is, is to go to a storyteller's convention. Every, anybody ever been to a storyteller's convention? I'll let you know when I find one. We'll all go together. And all you do is sit around and listen to stories, professional storytellers. Wouldn't that be fun? I think I got a story or two I could tell at that convention. So do you. People love stories. Invariably, we listen in when somebody's telling a story. We want to kind of get the gist of what happened to you. To testify is simply to tell your story. And let me tell you, I don't know if you're an expert in any area of life, but you are definitely an expert in one thing. Every one of you, I want to congratulate you, are experts in one thing. You're experts on yourself. 
You know more about yourself and your life, your past, your present, than anybody else on earth. If anybody has a right to tell the, your story, it's you. You can do that. And again, without uh, contradiction, people cannot stop you and say, wait a minute, that's not true. I don't know. I was blind, but now I see. I used to be a violent man, like Paul says, and I've been changed. My life has been transformed. Uh, let me show you a testimony from the Old Testament. We'll look at one from the Old, and we'll look at one from the New. If you have your Bibles, split it down the middle there to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. Like the Apostle Paul, this guy was uh, heinous. He was violent. Uh, he was persecuting the Jews. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Until he encounters God. And his life is transformed. I love this story. Daniel chapter 4, if you're with me in the Bible there. Let me just pick and choose a few of the, of the verses there in Daniel 4. Uh, verse 1 and following, if you're with me. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nations, men of every language who live in all our world. That's you and I included, isn't it? May you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Here he goes. Here's a story. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. And I had a dream that made me afraid as I was lying in my bed. The images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. Goes on to say, so I called together my magicians. I shared my dream. Nobody could decipher what it meant. So then he brings in Daniel, Belteshazzar, as he's called in uh, their language, to interpret his dream. Verse 13, in the vision I saw while lying on my bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots be bound with iron and bronze. May they remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. And let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and be given that of a mind of an animal, until seven times pass by for him. There's the dream. As you recall the incident, Daniel receives from God the revelation, the explanation of the dream. And he gives it to the king. It's bad news, isn't it? And he tells uh, Nebuchadnezzar that God is merciful. If you renounce your sins by doing what is right, and you put away wickedness and stop oppressing people, he says, maybe your prosperity will continue. Well, he doesn't. And it doesn't. Twelve months later. The dream comes about. Let me pick up in verse 33 in, in chapter 4 there. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people. He ate grass like cattle. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Have you noticed those nails out there? They're out there. Every now and then you'll see somebody with bird claws, won't you? At the end of that time, what time? Seven times, which uh, as you follow that theme in the book of Daniel, you'll know that times refers to years. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. That's a powerful concept, isn't it? People are insanely committed to all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the will of God in their life. And it isn't until they finally, maybe at their lowest moment in their life, look up that they begin to think and see things clearly from God's perspective. His sanity is restored. 
And I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? It's the kind of God he is. He is sovereign over all. He reigns over everything and everyone. And Nebuchadnezzar came to that conclusion. He thought he was God until God humbled him. Verse 36, at the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me and the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. I love verse 37. I've got mine underlined. Maybe you do too. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, believe it or not, I praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. Because everything he does is right. All his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, finish the line. He is able to humble. Anybody walking in pride these days, watch out. You're going to trip up. And if necessary, God will humble you. Because he loves you and he wants you to know what Nebuchadnezzar discovered. That there's only one God in heaven and earth. And it's not you. He alone is God. What a powerful story. What a great story. And he wrote it down and Daniel included it in his book so that the peoples and nations and languages all times and all places could know what kind of God he is through the example of Nebuchadnezzar. Now the Apostle Paul tells his story in the book of, of uh, Acts chapter 26. Briefly there, if you have your Bible, Acts chapter 26 and as we mentioned, witnesses uh, standing before the court, that's exactly what Paul is doing. He's witnessing before the king. King Agrippa, uh, grandson of uh, Herod the Great, who persecuted the babies there in Bethlehem. Uh, Antipas, the next in line, and finally King Agrippa. And so he's standing before this powerful, and uh, I would like to say like uh, Nebuchadnezzar was, uh, this violent and a wicked man who is a king of, of sorts. And he's given permission to speak. So Paul motioned with his hand and he began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews. And especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. He was of a Jewish lineage, although it's not clear whether he practiced Judaism to any degree. King Agrippa. Verse 4, the Jews all know the way I lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they will, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. Boy, those are the guys that gave Jesus a headache, didn't they? The Pharisees. Paul says, I was a Pharisee. And now it is because of my hope in what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is the promise our 12 tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night, O King. It is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. But why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? There's the hope, the resurrection from the dead. And Paul's going to make a case for Jesus' resurrection, and that's exactly what's transformed him. Verse 9, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Any opposition to the name of Jesus today? Have you noticed... Are people opposed to you and I speaking about Jesus, uh, doing Christian things, Christianity per se? Uh, in a couple of months here, I'd like to suggest uh, from Jude chapter, or Jude 1, 3, there's only one chapter, Jude verse 3, uh, the phrase, contend for the faith, that we take some time this fall to think about what would it take to gear up individually and as a congregation so that we're better able to defend our faith. 
what we believe. Uh, that is coined uh, p apologetics, uh, the, the act of uh, defending or knowing how to defend your faith, which means you have to study your faith. You have to know what you believe. You also have to study other people's beliefs. You need to know something about world religions. You need to know something about atheism. Uh, you, you also could stand to learn something about other Christian religions or groups uh, within Protestantism, Catholicism, Orthodox religion. Uh, contend for the faith. Paul says that's exactly what I'm going to do here. Verse 9. Because so many have opposed the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I was doing exactly the same. That is just what I did in Jerusalem on the authority of the chief priests. I put many of the saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, Paul speaking. Many times I went from a synagogue, one synagogue to another to have them punished, and I tried to force them to blaspheme, to deny Christ. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. On one of those journeys, Paul says, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests from Jerusalem. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And I asked him, who are you, Lord? The answer, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you, and I will appoint you as a servant and as a witness. There's our word of what you have seen from me and what I will show you. And I will rescue you from your own people, that is the Jews, and from the Gentiles. And I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by me in faith. That's your assignment, Paul. Those are your marching orders. And Paul telling the king, that's what happened to me. No disputing it. My life has been transformed. The Jews can tell you, they remember me, the kind of Jew that I was. And the experience that changed my, the course of my life, 180 degrees, from a persecutor of Christ to one who is persecuted for Christ. What a story. What a powerful example of God's mercy and grace as Paul testifies to the king. So what is the role of the mind here? We've been talking about our minds as a matter of the mind. Uh, well, basically two things. You need to understand and explain the gospel to people. You need to know what the gospel, the good news is, and how to explain it to others. Do you? But secondly, I would suggest that you ought to think about your own life experience. And most likely, none of us can compete with uh, Nebuchadnezzar or the Apostle Paul or the blind man. And the, the transformation that occurred in their lives, I, I would wager that every one of you has seen changes in your life. If you've really encountered Christ, something has happened to you. And to be able to share that with people, to know that and to be able to explain it to people is part of our assignment as witnesses. To explain the gospel and to relate your experience, your story. So what is your story? What happened to you? What difference has God made in your life? Was it a crisis that occurred? I think crisis is one of God's greatest tools. Uh, I think it was Mother Teresa who said God uses a crisis like a megaphone to get our attention. And it took some of you going pretty low. Right? When that limb struck a head here in the audience, somebody's head. And just about killed him, and he realized, my life is in jeopardy here. What, what if I would have died? Or when the ice gave way on that fateful night, and under the water he went. And uh, he called out to God and unexplainably found himself as he's breaking through the ice and trying to get out, 
crawling across the ice, the next memory he has, as if God had rescued him. Those are crisis experiences, maybe cancer, or maybe a divorce, or maybe a financial ruin, or whatever it is that God could take in your life and say, let me get your attention through this. I'm going to speak to you now. And like Nebuchadnezzar, your, your sanity is going to be restored as you look up to me. On the other hand, many of you have never had a major crisis. One of my kids uh, coming home from some uh, youth meeting or something one time said, you know, Dad, I wish uh, I was like the guy that spoke tonight. And it was a classic uh, conversion experience. And the guy was on drugs. I mean, you, you know the gig, don't you? He was on drugs. He got in a wreck. He's in the hospital, and a friend brings him a Bible. I, I believe it. And it was a lightning strike moment crisis. And I told my son, I said, no, I'm glad you didn't have to go through all that. God got your attention at a young age. And you were fortunate. It wasn't through crisis. It was through process. I think that's the right, that's the best case scenario is to start a child out on the right path and to nurture that kid until he or she is old enough to determine I'm following Jesus on my own. That was my experience. I mean, I grew up in a Christian family and was in church most Sundays. Uh, we were generally good people. I was a believer in Jesus. Uh, there's no doubt that, that God was real. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe the Bible was the word of God. I just hadn't read it until I went to college. And I started rubbing shoulders with guys in my dormitory who didn't believe in Jesus, who didn't believe the Bible was the word of God, who hadn't grown up in church. And they had reasons for why they were against Christianity, opposing it, as we saw with the Apostle Paul. And I didn't have answers. And so I had to go back and rethink everything that I had been taught. Was it true or not? And personalize, thankfully, personalize what was my uh, heritage as my own personal faith and experience in Christ. It was a process for me of progress, of slow transformation as God worked. And probably in some of you or maybe many of your cases, that's true as well. But now to be able to say, you know what, uh, I'm different than I used to be. There are differences in my life, tangible difference I can point to, to the honor and glory of God. Thanks to him, he saved me and he's brought me through. And he's moving me in a whole new direction. You shall be my witnesses. You're to testify. You're to tell your story to people. And explain to them the gospel, the good news. Now, notice in your outline, I'm going to suggest there are four aspects to the gospel that uh, probably are helpful to understand. Again, uh, this fall we get into... Uh, this area of contending for the faith, I'd like to go back and work on this a little bit as a congregation. Uh, but in essence, in summary, the gospel that we are to preach to all creation, as Jesus tells us there in Mark 16, can be summarized in four simple points. God is, number one. There is a God. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. He's powerful. He's mighty, as we've sang today. But he's also good. God is great and God is good. That's good theology. You know that little prayer we teach our kids, so we thank him for our food. He is both great and he is good. He's that kind of a God. What about mankind? We've fallen away. We've taken a different path. We're on the wrong side of the ravine, aren't we? And we're stuck on a ledge like I was. That is the, the, the truth the experience of every human being today, and it is a result of sin, as the Bible calls it. Self-centered living separates us from the life of God. The good news, and that's what the gospel is, it's good news, is Jesus Christ has come to our rescue. It's God to the rescue through Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. He's the Savior of humanity. He alone offers forgiveness of sins. That's a biggie. Although our culture today is denying the reality of sin, right and wrong, objective truth. You're going to have to do some work to convince people that, no, there really is moral right and wrong, absolute truth. Sin is what separates us from God. And Jesus Christ comes to forgive sins. 
and to offer us eternal life with God. God is, mankind is, Jesus Christ is, and each person must. Here's where personal responsibility comes in. Every person must reckon with that truth and make a decision. I think by the help of God, whether they will trust him as Savior or whether they're going to go it alone and pay for their own sins, which is in essence what they would do. Each person must turn to Christ by faith for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. In summary, that's the gospel. That's it. That's the story, his story, his history. Uh, there are ways that we can share this in different formats, uh, tools that uh, have been developed. You know, a tool just simply facilitates a task. You got the right tool, it's a lot easier to do the task, isn't it? Uh, you ever try to change a tire without a tire iron? Boy, very hard to do. You ever try to screw in a, uh, a screw without a screwdriver using a wrench or some other? It's just not designed to do that. And there are tools that are designed to help you and I communicate our faith. And I would like to suggest that you pick up on these. I, I like this one, the four spiritual laws. I've used it for years, ever since I was part of Campus Crusades ministry. The four points that I just ho outlined are basically the four spiritual laws as they're outlined here with Bible verses that kind of back them up. Uh, here's one life's most important question. Perhaps you've seen that. Billy Graham uh, puts out one. Um, here's one that we have out in the, the hall that I, I think bridges the gap between people. It's our care notes. Do not be afraid. And if they were to go to the website here, peace-today.org uh, or .com, they could discover the testimonies that are given there. there's a number of you that are online sharing your stories just saying what happened to you and if somebody were to go there having received maybe a card from you and to pick up on that website they would uh, they would hear the gospel explained very simply through people through people's experiences uh, we did the romans road we've done this over the years i think these are out in the lobby there as well uh, starting in Romans 1 and finishing in Romans 10, you could, you could actually take the Bible and the book of Romans with somebody and say, well, let me show you what the message of God means. And just in the book of Romans, uh, you could walk them through a, a half a dozen verses on the Romans road. Well, there's, there's a number of ways that you and I can share the story, the gospel. But people need to be open. They need to be willing to hear. And many people you know and I know are not. Yet. Yet. Let me suggest two situations that come about in every life where people are most likely to listen to your story, to listen to the gospel. Uh, two T words. Transition and tension. People, when they are in transition and their lives are in flux, when changes come upon them unexpectedly and they find themselves insecure, are often open to Christians talking about God, more so than prior. Intentions, boy, those are any of the, come, of the crisis that inevitably uh, visit all of us at some point in our lives. You know somebody who's been closed off to God, but when you see that person in crisis, their life is being tensed, stretched, Pray and look for an opportunity to share. They may be open like they've never been before. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. See, the on a hill cannot be hid. Men don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel. What do they do with it? They put it up on a stand. Let your light so shine like that before men so that they might see your good works. And glorify your Father in heaven. That's your assignment and mine as we walk out of here this morning. Some of you are going to enter into some dark places this week. You're going to come around people who are in dark places themselves. They're living in darkness. And your assignment and mine is let your light shine. Christian life is a matter of the mind. Be mindful of the influence that you have, God-given influence that you have as a believer in Jesus Christ, and use it. You're like salt. 
stays corruption. You're like light. It dispels darkness. Shine forth. Step out in faith. Speak up. Tell somebody. Like Nebuchadnezzar of old. This happened to me. Like that blind man, I, I do know one thing. This is what happened in my life. This is what God did in my life. There's no disputing that. Nobody can say, well, you're wrong. That's your experience. They can try to discredit you or your experience, but they cannot dispute the fact that God has changed your life. Tell people. And then explain them to them how they can experience a similar change. The gospel is the great news of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you as we close this morning, if you would pray for someone as we finish. You can do that by inviting the Holy Spirit of God to prompt your mind. It's a matter of the mind. God wants to work in your mind this morning through your intellect. I, I started out by saying the Christian life is an intentional life on purpose. He wants you to think about somebody who needs Christ and to pray for them. And with the premise, as you pray, God, if you can use me, I'm not very good. I'm not worth much. But if you can use me, I'm willing. You know somebody who's in the dark? Could you tell them your story? Could you let your light shine? Where you're seated this morning, why don't you pray? I don't know, maybe somebody here is in the dark this morning. Maybe you feel like you are shut out from God for whatever reason. And you know you personally need Jesus Christ to save you. Well, you can do that right now by simply calling upon the name of the Lord. And the promise is you will be saved. Acknowledge your need for a Savior. Confess your sin. You've strayed, you're off path there. You chose the wrong path. Do you want to follow him? Ask him to forgive you and to restore your life. He's that kind of a God, you know. But likely all of us know somebody who is stuck. They're not well. They really have a need, maybe several. Why don't you ask God to work on behalf of that person and volunteer to be a, a witness if he can use you to approach them, if he can use you, be available. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning as we finish up here thinking about such a significant thing is, is the gospel, the good news, in a world that is staggering, and too often Christians who are stuttering, who don't have answers, when people desperately are seeking truth, help, hope. Forgive us for that, Lord, and motivate us, each of us. Prompt us as we go out today. We pray for somebody. Uh, give us a creative way to make a connection with that person. Whether a phone call or a visit, a letter. And I pray that you would energize us through the discipline of evangelism to better represent you in our generation. It's our prayer today, not only for ourselves, but for the people that we could reach. And we pray that by the help of your Holy Spirit and always through Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, why don't you stand with me this morning? Let's finish where we started at Psalm 117 as uh, all nations and all peoples ought to give him thanks and praise. Thank you.